Amen. That is our cry this morning as we turn to hear the word of the Lord read aloud from 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That is the word of God for God's people today. You may be seated. And as you're seated, just wanted to say thank you for the weeks off that you give us and the extra weeks of making sure that my faith is not in my own abilities, but to spend a few weeks um, resting in Christ alone. And that is why uh, we've turned today to this text, uh, so that we preach Christ alone, so that we all, uh, as we journey through this life together, have Christ alone. So good to be back with you and thankful for the time that you've given me over the past few weeks. Now let's pray together and ask for God's help. So Father, remind us that apart from you, we are blind and poor weary, but that the great call of the gospel is that those who now know their nothingness, in fact would boast in it, can come freely, run into the Father's arms, who saw us while we were a long way off wraps us in arms of love as he unites us to his son so that those who were blind and poor now have everything the father has and we have it because of Christ so we pray on this Lord's day that you would give us eyes to see Jesus Christ and him crucified and that no matter where we find ourselves or what abilities we have or don't have or an emotional state, even fear and weakness and much trembling, that you would lead us to the cross and give us the grace to cling to Christ. In him alone we pray. Amen. So this is Reformation Sunday. Uh, If you're new to Five Points, it's uh, one of the highlights of our life together corporately. Usually have a a lunch today and uh, just things like that, celebrating God's grace to us in the gospel and the way that the reformers 500 years ago uh, helped the church recover the gospel. And so on this Reformation Sunday, especially in the year that we find ourselves in with all the peculiarities that we are enduring, the Spirit uh, directed me over the last few weeks to use 1 Corinthians 2 as today's text because it takes us to the heart of the Reformation. And it reminds us that when we conclude our gathering, not only today, but every Sunday, week in and week out, what really determines whether or not this was a good Sunday or a complete waste of time is not if the music got to you, it's not if the prayer resonated with you, it's not at some moment you got a shiver down your spine or maybe a tear in your eye, got choked up at some point, or just this feeling of overwhelming grace rushing over you. None of that, but whether or not Jesus Christ and him crucified was the heartbeat, the center, the the focus of everything we did together. And in the 500 years, 503 years, in just a couple days now, since Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the Wittenberg door, the temptation to leave off the five solas of the Reformation, including solus Christus, or Christ alone, what we're going to focus on this morning, hasn't gone away. But in fact, it's raring. 
And so 1 Corinthians 2 teaches us what must remain central. For five points, not to just say we're a Reformation church, or for us just to nod that, yes, we're that and not that, but to actually be a Reformation church. And, and again, not just what we do on Sundays or this one hour that we gather as if it's an event, but we, who we are, the people, the church, the people of God, how we're called to be Reformation people. And we have three ways our passage shapes us, guards us into being a Reformation people. And so we have the message, the manner, and the motive of our proclamation. The message, the manner, and the motive. And first, the message of our proclamation. Look at verses 1 and 2. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Uh, I wonder if you know what we are doing here. <laughs> like, and I mean like right now. Like why don't we just keep singing? That was great. We have talented people and I'm thankful for the ways they work on things. The guys up in the booth making sure you can hear it. People serving all over the place. Why, why didn't we just keep on singing? Have a couple verses continue to be splattered out and just keep on, like what are we doing right now? I hope I, I know, I, part of my livelihood depends on this, so thank you, right? But I mean, why are sermons still a part of all this? I mean, haven't we moved beyond stuff like this? You can, you can watch sermons online, so, so why are we doing this? Things have changed. We've got new technologies. Attention spans are shorter. We make movies now. So why this still? And it's because the church is a proclaiming people. We're heralds of good news. No, I'm not saying we can't use technology or that we never engage or consider the culture in our proclaiming the good news, but rather who we are, okay, namely a proclaiming people, a message people, drives what we do. That has to be the focus. We can't lose the message. And so that drives what we do. And as a proclaiming people, then our message then drives our methods. And so we don't even just create this message. Not only are we a proclaiming people, and so this is why what we do, because the word of God gives life and sustains life and equips us for life. Not only that, we don't create the message. I was talking to one of our sweet older saints on the way in. She gave me a little encouragement. I didn't know if this is like riding a bike or I'm going to preach for two hours because I don't know what I'm saying or we're just going to abort this thing after a little bit and you know, try again next week and she's like hey as long as we go to this we're going to be alright because I don't need to create the message God hasn't called us to proclaim a message that we create so not just preachers but all of us we don't have to walk out into the culture and, and try to come up with some cl clever way of talking about Jesus. We proclaim something that's been given to us. And verse 1 says, it's the testimony of God. It's not just your testimony, but it's God. We testify to who He is and what He's doing, what He's promised to do. And so as we work through God's Word week in and week out, we proclaim not ourselves, not a message of our choosing, nor of our creating, but the churches of people who testify to who God is and what he's doing. We preach, we proclaim, we testify of God. And even this is so out of step with our world today. And I don't think much of you would, you know, say that's wrong. I don't think anyone you would disagree with that. But it's not only just out of step with our world, it's out of step with something deep inside here, isn't it? And so much of our own daily lives is driven by our innate ability to testify of ourselves. And that's what social media is driven on and why it's not going anywhere anytime soon, no matter who has to testify before Congress about whatever's going on. They're going to keep making money because we love talking about ourselves. I mean, they can, we do it with the most mundane, non-spectacular things, don't we? 
Post pictures of what we ate for breakfast. Well, who cares? You do. That's why you post it, because you love testifying of ourselves. But God's people are now proclaimers, not of ourselves, nor of our abilities, nor of our achievements, but of the testimony of what God achieved in us because of Jesus. And so in other words, the heartbeat of our lives has now become what God has done in Jesus by the power of the Spirit to save sinners like you and me. So we can sing songs like, Come you weary, heavy laden, come find rest forevermore. Not in us, or not in finally achieving something, but in what God achieved. And so is that the heartbeat of your life? So that as you go out, you proclaim not yourself, but the testimony of God. Is that going to be the heartbeat of our life together, no matter what's going on? We keep thinking it's not going to get any worse, and then it keeps getting worse. I don't want to be a total bear of bad news this morning, but what happens if 2021 is worse than 2020? What's going to keep us together, unified? What's going to keep us together worshiping? What's, what's going to help us say, who cares what happens in the world? We know that God is still at work. Because he's been at work in me. He is still building his church. Not because we have it all together, or we got great ministries, or we have this, or we have that, but because we proclaim a crucified Savior who promised he would build his church. And so the people of God gathered together at five points. What is going to be our heartbeat together? And one way we can know that is so is seen in the phrase that follows the testimony of God. Look at it with me. Lofty speech or wisdom. We can know if the message of the cross is the heartbeat of our life together because Paul says he came with that testimony of God, not with lofty speech or wisdom. It wasn't marked by that. And he points that out because in those days, the culture of Corinth was marked by just this love of eloquent oratory. They didn't have Netflix back then, you know. I know, shocker, Okay. Any, they, they, so what they did was they were on the edge of their seat dazzled by great speakers. There's a speaking circuit and the best speakers got the biggest crowds. And so like we binge watch Netflix, you know, they could binge listen to speakers who could have this way with words and wit and uh, wisdom and well-timed humor and heart-wrenching stories, whatever it would do to keep them on the edge of their seats the speakers that excelled in Corinth were ones that could draw you in and captivate your heart and imagination. And he says lofty speech and wisdom because it didn't even matter if it was true. If the best speakers could tell you lies to your face, but they dazzled you with more pizzazz and were more entertaining than people who actually were talking about something they knew about, those guys wouldn't have any audience. And the people who were, you know, just could spin lies with a great story had all the following. And so Paul, though, says, but I came to you, and look at you. You've been drawn in and gathered, but it wasn't because I was impressive. I actually was very unimpressive. And you can read um, some notes about what Paul looked like. There's, no one's exactly sure, but we see some hints throughout the, old, uh, the uh, New Testament, some of the letters, and in some of the biographies that are given around that time. He was maybe short. There was something wrong with his physical set, like maybe he got beat too many times for the gospel and so he had this limp or these crooked legs or he some he was bald had a long nose and then he comes in and he he's just stumbling over his speech left and right but somehow there's a group of people in Corinth now called the church they're gathered. They've been drawn in, and he's got no pizzazz. He says, I, I, I came to you unimpressively with a message that matched my Savior. Look at chapter 1, just up a couple uh, paragraphs, beginning in verse 17. He says, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. He knew it. He's like, I came to you with folly. And look at verse 21. For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. 
For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So he says, I came unimpressively with an unimpressive message of an unimpressive Savior. And he doesn't mean in reality. Of course, Christ is magnificent. But what he's saying, he's saying, I came with the message and how the world saw Jesus. I knew it was folly, but I didn't try to dress it up. I preached Jesus, who the world thought was weak for being crucified, and the Greeks thought it was all folly. How do you get saved by someone dying? In the eyes of the world, Paul's message was weak and foolish. But it's true wisdom. As Paul says elsewhere, that Jesus lived, died, rose again, and is reigning now. That was all God's plan, his wise plan from before the foundation of the world to save a people for the glory of his name. That's true wisdom. Whether or not the world recognizes it or not. And not only that, Jesus Christ crucified is in reality real power. For through the cross, defeating sin and death, as Jesus bore our sins upon himself so that we might die to sin and be made alive to righteousness. That's real power. So true wisdom and real power, which means the message we proclaim is never enhanced. It cannot be enhanced by dressing it up or Paul looking cool or coming with great, you know, props or dazzling effects of speech. The message he proclaims is never enhanced to make the message more palatable to those around us. In fact, when we do those things, we destroy the message. We get in the way. When you add anything to the message of Jesus Christ and him crucified, you don't enhance it. You actually destroy it. You rob it of its power. You empty of it of its power. Anything but the pure message of Jesus Christ and him crucified isn't just a a different gospel or a lesser gospel, it's actually no gospel at all. I, I'm allergic to almonds, and so um, Becky had bought some cheese this past week. You'll get that in a minute. And she told me not to eat it because it was almond-based, plant-derived, non-dairy cheese. <laughs> now, I, I really, th the first thing out of my mouth was, how is that even true? Right, so and I'm not I'm not offended. Hey, I, 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 if you want to go, this is not about cheese. So just bear with me for a minute, okay? This is not a fight about plant derived whatever, okay? But I just thought like the first thing out of my mouth was how it, if it's non dairy, plant derived, it, then it's not cheese. It, and so it is with the gospel, right? If you're not preaching Jesus Christ crucified at the heart of it, and I'm trusting not in that, in God's power to save sinners, even if the world thinks it's folly, if you walk out, talk to family members and friends and coworkers, and you're trusting in yourself or your arguments and not Christ alone, it is not the gospel. You're not proclaiming the gospel if it's anything but Jesus Christ and him crucified. And that doesn't mean to only proclaim the death of Jesus, as if his life or his resurrection or his promises that he's coming again have, have no bearing here. It's not like we just talk about Jesus on the cross 40 times in two paragraphs and you've preached Christ crucified. Because as we saw in chapter 1, what Paul means was, when he says crucified, he knew the mocking and disdain and rejection he would face in preaching a gospel of a crucified Savior. It's actually, I'm setting everything up so that they won't believe and that the only way they can believe is if God moves. And, and so we're not proclaiming the cross only as if the empty tomb has nothing to do with our message. Because later in chapter 15, especially verse 3, Paul teaches what is of first importance. He says that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. So there's the crucifixion. That he was buried... And that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. This is first importance, but multiple things. And that Jesus then went on to appear to the apostles and to Paul himself. And so Jesus crucified includes the resurrection. It's also known in chapter 1 as the word of the cross or preaching Christ. It's the God, they're all, they're all a synonyms for the same thing. And it must be so that the crucifixion and the preaching of it includes the resurrection. Because Paul goes on in chapter 15... In verses 17 and 32 to say if Christ has not been raised 
your faith is futile, and you're still in your sins. So he's not saying only preach the cross, and then by the time he gets to chapter 15, he's like, wait, 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 let's, let's preach the resurrection too. He's saying, no, if the dead are not raised, then this is all nonsense. Get out, why are you here? Get out there, eat, drink, and, and, and be merry, because tomorrow you die. And so the phrase, Jesus Christ and him crucified, is shorthand for preaching the gospel. The life and death and resurrection of Jesus, the person and work of Jesus. We're a people who proclaim at the heart of our life together, and the reason why we exist is to proclaim that we are sinners in need of a Savior, and that we can't save ourselves. And that Savior that we need is Jesus Christ, who lived the perfect life God demands that we could not live, who stood in our place condemned, who died in our place on the cross, who was buried in our place in the grave, who then was raised to newness of life, conquering sin and death for us, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness and be alive with him forever. And that is true for all those who will believe in Christ alone. And it's not up to me to convince people. And it's not up to you to shore up their salvation. But to proclaim Christ. Because that's the power of God to save sinners. And that's our message, and it must always be our message. And you notice there, in verse 2, that Paul had to decide whether or not that would be his message. And we too must decide. And what better day to decide than on a Reformation Sunday? What will be our message? Knowing that it's going to get more hostile. Seemingly so. That, that not just to call people sinners, but what we need saving from and what is actually sin may more and more cause us not just rejection and mocking, but real persecution. And what are we going to be trusting in? We must decide what the message of our proclamation will be. And then secondly, we see the manner of our proclamation. The manner of our proclamation. And I know I've been off for four weeks, but that was the longest point. So don't worry, you're not going to be here till three o'clock. <laughs> so the manner, the message of our proclamation and the manner now of our proclamation. Look at verses three and four. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Uh, when we head to the cottage during the summer, on the way up, inevitably one of our kids will ask, are we almost there? And it's because they just can't wait to get into the lake. They're excited. And you know that feeling as well, when you've been planning a trip and you're about to embark upon it. That feeling of excitement of the sights and the, the events and the things that you're going to be taking in. And Paul looks back on the moments before he arrived in Corinth and had none of those feelings. In fact, he... He looks back on those moments and knowing, having decided what his message is going to be, reveals the honest state of his heart. He was not on the edge of his seat and he wasn't just fearful, weak, and trembling in those first moments, but then once he got there, everything kind of just worked itself out and the butterflies went away after he got a good night's sleep. No, he was characterized by him being a mess. Constantly, my t while I was with you, he says. So that continuing time in Corinth was marked by weak, fearful, trembling. And so for those of you who deal with things on, on a regular basis, and for those of you who know, and the brothers and sisters that we have as we walk with them through fearful, weak, trembling times, maybe states of life, seasons of life, it is possible to have a steadfast certainty with your purpose and mission in life, to have an immovable, stubborn belief in God's sovereignty, uh, and even be an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, who then goes on to write 30% of the New Testament, and yet feel weak, fearful, and unable to stop your hands from shaking. And so when... Someone comes to you and honestly reveals weakness or fearful trembling. Remember Paul, brothers and sisters, because it may not be unbelief that's at the core of it, and it may mo take more than you quoting Romans 8, 28, 
Can you imagine the people in Corinth quoting Romans 8, 28 back to the guy who wrote it? <laughs> it's not just that. And I say that because I- in the moment, it is actually Paul's stubborn belief that God is sovereign and working all things together that I think he is weak and fearful and trembling because he's been emptied of all self-assurance. And I think that's something you must learn and continue to walk in, and you need the Spirit's help in, to be emptied of all self-assurance and self-pride and self-adulation and walking into a room knowing that if God doesn't move, you're going to be hated. And we see that in verse 4. He says, And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power. That's why he's weak and fearful and trembling. His stubborn belief in God's sovereignty. Have you ever seen a TED Talk? Technology, engineering, and design, I think is what it stands for. There are these short talks delivered with pinpoint accuracy. They're supposed to be 15 minutes long. Every speaker hits 15 minutes on the dot. They're polished, well-executed, wit, wisdom, balanced perfectly, and you can find one on just about any topic. And inherently, I'm not saying anything's wrong with them. Some of them are really quite good. But that is the complete opposite of the manner which Paul puts forward for proclaiming the message of Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, he's not advocating sloppy preaching. It would make the pastors here at Five Points' job very easy if it was. I just come up here and be like, well, I don't know. Let's get after it together. And who knows what happens? Let's let's rest that that's not what Paul is advocating. In fact, he speaks of being an approved workman, not ashamed, and other so it's not that. But I think what he's talking about is the plausible words of wisdom. Right? So my words need to be plausible. If he was just talking about sloppy preaching, he would just stop right after plausible. But he said, no, plausible words of wisdom, meaning that he doesn't agonize over turns of phrase or do I have enough wit and wisdom? Or, do I have a heart-wrenching story that'll really draw them in? Is my intro and my conclusion points wrapped up perfectly in this bow so you can take it out when you leave? That's not what his trust is in saying, how can I know Christ more so I can proclaim Christ better? I want to know Christ more, not not things about him or my notes or this, that, or more. I don't need to put it all together in a package. And he's not also advocating boring preaching. And we need to work on this, and I, we can be boring, we, but he's not just advocating not trying and boring preaching, because you can only be boring while proclaiming Christ if Christ is boring to you. And you won't be boring if what you're proclaiming is something you love. I was not bored yesterday. Never mind. I won't rub it into my friends down here on the front row. I was not, right? When things happen that get you excited, you're not boring while you proclaim it. How can we be bored with a Savior like Jesus? So he's not advocating boring or sloppy preaching. He's saying don't trust in the manner, the values, the methods currently reigning in culture to get through to your hearers. You don't need to be the smartest in the room. You don't need to be the best speaker. You don't need to have it all put together. You don't need to have the right clothes or the right music and this, that, and the other. We should have Jillian come up here and play underneath me while we're doing it. You know, when I get a little louder, she gets a little louder. When I get quieter, she gets a little quieter. Like we got to work the room. He's saying, I came weak, fearful, and trembling because I know that if the Holy Spirit doesn't move in power, that this pleading proclamation of the Jesus he loves will just fall on deaf ears. And not only that, but that if God doesn't move to save sinners through the preaching of Christ and him crucified, to open their hearts to the message of Jesus, they will reject the only Savior there is for sinners. And he says, I'm weak and fearful, not just because he's scared, because I don't want to get in the way of that. I don't want to preach the cross in a way that actually empties empties it of its power, which is the only power to save. Do you see what he's saying? We can get in the way of the cross in the manner which we proclaim it. 
This is what he says in chapter 1, verse 17. The second half of it, he says, I came preaching not with eloquent words of wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but, but, to, who, to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So let me preach foolishly so that I'm not in any way the reason why people miss or are shielded from the actual power of God. The stark reality, brothers and sisters, is that we can be a church that reads of the cross, sings of the cross. I can stand in front of the cross seemingly preaching the cross and yet empty the cross of its very power to save sinners. You wonder why I want to make sure I have a heart that's ready to do this. God, help us if we ever get in the way of the cross. And so Paul knew that God must show up in the demonstration of the Holy Spirit and of power if there was even going to be a Corinthian church. And the same is true here. There would be no five points community church unless God moved through the preaching of Jesus Christ and him crucified to save sinners. Or else it's just a club on Sunday morning and we should be having brunch. And so five points on this Reformation Lord's Day. We must decide not only what our message will be, but also the manner in which we will proclaim it. Will we happily take on weakness, trembling, be foolish to the world to preach Jesus? And we must decide not only about the message, but the manner, because our manner can either serve our proclamation of the gospel, or it will subvert it. And we can say we believe God is sovereign and the gospel is his power to save, yet the manner of our proclamation proves otherwise. Think about all the things that could get our trust in this gospel ministry rather than Jesus Christ and him crucified. We need a smiling greeting team. We need piping hot coffee. We need good lights in here. We need a, got to get out of this gym. We need a better this, a better that. Good nursery. Lighting, music. Um, the sermons. Get out of, get out of the word. Let's talk about all the things going on in our world and the hot topics, and let's make sure everyone leaves with seven things to do to have a great week this morning. And I'm not saying that none of those can have any place. Again, he's not, he's not saying to the exclusion of everything, but what is going to be our trust? And brothers and sisters, not only on Sundays, but in all of our lives then, what we do here begins to shape how we how we view ministry in and through our lives. The manner that we serve the message of the proclamation of Jesus will come through. So that's why we take great care to shape the things of our life together so that we can move out together in a manner that uh, matches the message that we proclaim. Because God has tied his power to save sinners, not to our ability or our eloquence or our creative ideas, but solely to proclaiming Jesus Christ and him crucified. And so Paul's happy to boast in his weakness and in his foolishness in the eyes of the world to preach Jesus because his manner reveals that he believes truly that it is up to God and God alone to save sinners. And he has given us the means of doing it through our message, preaching folly and weakness in the eyes of the world, but it is the power and wisdom of God in Jesus Christ and him crucified. So that's our manner. Then thirdly then, our motive. What is the motive of our proclamation? proclamation? Look at verse 5. So that your faith may not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So five points. If our message is going to remain Jesus Christ and him crucified, and if our manner will continue to be a one of trust, not in self, but in demonstration of the spirit and of God's power, then what must our motive always be? What must we remind each other of, drive each other towards? In other words, what does it take for us to have this Christ-centered message and this God-glorifying manner always be true of us? 
Not just deciding day in and day out, that's part of it, but, but how are we going to make that decision? What's going to motivate it? And so that it never changes for five points, that we are a people who proclaim Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Well, our motive must be the Reformation cry of soli deo gloria. If we're going to preach Christ alone, we've got to be in it for God's glory alone. And we see that in the phrase, in the power of God, there in verse 5. But that refers back to what he always, already talked about in chapter 1, verse 18, where the preaching of the gospel is what? The power of God. So he's not talking about, you know, this, uh, I, I think sometimes to our detriment, right, we, we, we think you've got to have these big miracles or this big flash or this big feeling or the Holy Spirit's got to knock everyone down. And that's the power of God. But what he actually says is, we are all experiencing right now by his grace the power of God I hope I've prayed because I hope I'm preaching Jesus Christ and him crucified that's the power of God it's at work right now whether we can see it or know it or feel it and so my motive is then not your reaction or, or, or not people f falling on bended knees repenting which we all hope for but that's not our motive if, if an emotional reaction is our motive, then we're doing things pretty wrong. And then we could change things to get that response. But then our faith would not be resting in the power of God, but in me or the wisdom of the elders or of whoever you're sitting under at any time of life. But it is the power of God that we find in the preaching of the gospel that is his power for those who are being saved. And so what saves then, friends, is not your response to the gospel. It's a fruit. That's a fruit, but it's not the ground of it. What saves is not your response to gospel. What saves is not my or any other preacher and their ability that you sit under, or the, under in the course of your life to help you understand it, to get you to remember everything, to, to, to entertain or to even speak well every Sunday. God sovereignly saves through the preaching of his Son. And it's through the preaching of his son that spirits unite sinners to his son. And all that so we glory in Jesus. Look at the end of chapter 1. That's what Paul, that's driving Paul's whole point. It's not that we can't boast. We should be a boasting people. But let the one who boasts, boast only in the Lord. That's our motive. You can boast in the Lord whether you're a very good speaker or not. In fact, Paul seems to be a horrific public speaker. And I think, in fact, that over the last few weeks, we would be tempted if one of the guys who came in here looked like Paul, acted like Paul, and spoke like Paul. That's the preacher. And I'm not just talking about you, I'd be talking about me. But Paul says, I preach Jesus, and I preach him weak and foolishness to the world. But that's because I want to boast only in the Lord. And I want you to boast only in the Lord. Not in the way we do things here, not in the way that I hope are helpful. See how weird this is? I hope I, it's, I'm not trying to say I hope I do a terrible job so that if anything good happens, we know it's all the Lord. Paul's not throwing excellence under the bus. He's saying, I hope, like John the Baptist, I decrease so Jesus increases. And that's what we're doing here so that we may never boast in ourselves nor have our faith rest in the wisdom of men but only in the power of God. All for the glory of God. And so even in the most Reformed churches, brothers and sisters, the great danger is to seem like on the outside we have it all together, both corporately and individually. As a people whose faith seems to be, you know, all, all, put, all, all put together. And, and the great danger then is to have ministries motivated towards that end. Producing a people whose faith does not rest in the power of God, but in our own efforts. And our faith must never rest in our own efforts. And as we read earlier, it's not that your own effort doesn't matter. 
but it's God who works in you, both to will and to work, but it's God, because then he gets the glory, not our ministries, not our leaders, but God. And so it must never rest, our faith, in our turning from sin. Your faith must never rest in your response to the preaching of the gospel in turning from sin, but it rests in the one you turn to from your sin. Because if we preach in a way that makes you feel like, oh, I, I feel really terrible, and before I get out of here, I gotta fix this, then it's my preaching and your response that your faith rests in, and that is no power at all. Because as soon as you screw up again, or as soon as I do something dumb, we're all in trouble. But if it's God who saves, then it's his power we boast in. So your faith must rest in the one we turn to from sin. And as much as we love doctrine, our faith cannot rest in being a Reformation church who has the right doctrine. Our faith must rest in the one our doctrine points to. We must glory in God and boast in Him. This is our God. Let's know more about Him, but then let's turn to one another and say, this is amazing. This is our God. Isn't this not amazing? Our faith must never rest in even our growth into Christ-likeness. And it cannot be shaken by the lack thereof. But our faith must rest in Christ alone and in his person and work. And the more you grip Christ, the more you'll realize he will never leave you nor forsake you. And that's the power of God. And the ironic thing about faith that trusts in anything but Jesus is that it actually never frees you. I'm going to say that again. The, the ironic thing about, about a faith that trusts in anything but Jesus or Jesus plus other things is that you're never free from the thing you think you're turning from. Tim Keller says it really helpfully in his book on work. He says, The gospel frees us from the relentless pressure of having to prove ourselves and secure our, our identity through work, for we are already proven and secure. So in other words, what Paul is really saying is I would have been weak, fearful, and trembling every time I stood up to proclaim Jesus if I trusted in my ability, in my wisdom, or my power. Why? Because there's another speaker coming right behind him, and he's got to stay one up on the crowds and the methods and, and the proclamation speaking circuit. I got to come up with something fancy. He's, he's never off the hamster wheel. He's always going to be weak, fearful, and trembling. But, <laughs> but, if his faith is in, is in Christ alone, or if his faith is not in how much we know about Jesus, or how deep my trust is of Jesus, or how much I endure for Jesus, or, or how, how hard I work for Jesus, but in everything that Jesus has done for me, I'm free. And that's the freedom we hold out to those around us. That here, here is the power of God. Here is true life and salvation. It's in Jesus and him alone. And what freedom and joy there is in a Savior who's done it all once and for all. Amen? I mean, that's freedom and joy. And so the preaching of Jesus Christ and him crucified, friends, summons all who hear that message to trust in Jesus alone for the forgiveness of sin and the hope of eternal life. The preaching of Jesus is a call to repentance. It may be met with rejection, and it often is, but it is also a summons to Christ because there's only one thing that saves from the wrath of God that is coming against sin. And that's the power of God hiding you in Christ alone. To be found hidden in Christ from the wrath of God. And that can happen because the amazing grace of the gospel is summed up in one of uh, my, my favorite hymns, Nothing in My Hands I Bring. That's the amazing grace of the gospel. You don't have to bring anything to be hidden in Christ. God hides you in Christ. Nothing in your hands that you can bring him, but simply to bring you to cling to Jesus. And so, friend, come to Christ and cling to him. And brothers and sisters, as we close, God's, God gifts faith through the hearing of the proclamation of the gospel. 
That's how, that's how God gifts faith. That's how he works it into people. By the proclamation of the gospel. Not how well we put it together, nor our ability to answer every question or debate perfectly, but whether or not Jesus Christ and him crucified is proclaimed. And do you know the word of the cross then well enough to be confident, not in yourself, but in the Christ you proclaim? Can you boast in this Christ? N not write a theological treatise on his person and his work. But can you talk about why he needed to live the life he did? Why he needed to stand in our place condemned? Why he went into our grave? Why he was raised again? And why he's coming again? And the hope that all that gives you, do you know that, that word well enough to be confident, not in how you put the argument together, but in the Christ you're proclaiming? That you proclaim Jesus. And isn't it freeing to know that you don't have to be a polished evangelist or an apologist with all the right answers, but to be one that is weak and needy, come you weary and heavy laden to the one who gives rest. As it's been said, can you be one beggar showing other beggars where to find bread? That's pretty easy. The one who says, I'm the bread of life, can you point to him? Can you, as one tired person, show other exhausted people where they can find rest? Forevermore. That's the rest we find as we trust in the power of God that needs nothing from us in order to save us. And so on this Reformation Lord's Day, may what fuels our life together both today and every day after, and may it never change, be the demonstration of the Spirit's power and of God's power in the proclamation of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And may that be our joy to always proclaim. Let's pray. So Father, we come amazed that we can have this life and joy in Christ without money and without price. And we pray for eyes to see the true condition of our hearts apart from you. We pray for that to be revealed to our friends and family and co-workers who do not know you as we proclaim Christ and live in the power of his spirit within us day in and day out, that you would give them ears to hear and that you would continue this reformation work that you began not just 500 years ago but long ago in the Garden of Eden for the glory of your name that our neighbors and the nations around us might come to worship you both now and forever with us. So we praise you for Christ. Without him, we would be lost. We praise you for the Spirit who united our hearts to him in faith and seals us as a guarantee of our inheritance on that last day. And we praise you, Father, that we who were once far off have been brought near, all because of your marvelous grace. So fill our hearts with singing for your glory alone, and give us the grace to leave today boasting in nothing else but in our Lord Jesus Christ and him crucified. Do it, we pray, for our eternal good and your glory forevermore. Amen.